Um, hi everyone, welcome to this Women in Economics Network webinar on alternative careers in economics. My name is Elizabeth Alvaro and I'm a manager at Deloitte Access Economics and it's my pleasure to facilitate this afternoon's event in my role as chair of the Women in Economics Network in South Australia. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Women in Economics Network or WEN, uh, we were founded to promote and support the careers of female economists in Australia. The network is linked to the Economic Society of Australia and we're pleased to be co-hosting this event with them today. Now, with the upside of technology, we're really excited to be reaching all corners of Australia and hopefully um, overseas as well. Um, however, we would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional owners of the lands wherever you may be this afternoon and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. I will shortly hand over to Professor Nancy Arthur, who will be moderating our panel for the next 40 minutes or so, but we will have some time for Q&A at the end. You will see a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, which has a Q&A function. So please, as we go along, please pop any questions you might have for our panel in there. And you can also upvote the questions you'd most like us to cover towards the end of the session. I'd also like to note that this session will be recorded and posted online at a later date. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panel, which includes Miriam Robin from the Australian Financial Review, Rowan Roberts from KPMG, and Zara Shoff from the Australian Space Agency. And our moderator, Nancy, Dean of Research from UniSA Business. Nancy, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much for the introductions and welcome to all of the participants who are, who are joining us today. I've been very excited about the opportunity to moderate this panel and learn more about careers in, in, in economics. Um, one of the things that I enjoy working in the field of career development are hearing people's career stories and what influenced their pathways uh, to certain careers. So I'm hoping we'll hear some uh, surprises perhaps, but also uh, really focus on what were the key uh, influencers for our panel members. So before we, we, we dive deeply into our topic, I'd like to get to know the, the panel a little bit more. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of you to please share why you chose to study economics at, at school or university. Uh, so, so thinking about what, what made you interested in it, and, and maybe there was a key, key experience that shaped your, your interest. So um, uh, Miriam, would you like to start that discussion with us today? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, um, I guess uh, I, I started studying economics at high school um, in year 11 and 12. And the reason I picked it, I think, was um, I, grew, I was born in Egypt and my parents were trying to migrate overseas uh, pretty much for most of my childhood. So I ended up, uh, they didn't succeed for a while. So we ended up having to go through a, a few different countries before we ended up in Australia. And uh, as a result of that, I think, um, I was just exposed to a lot of different uh, different countries of different wealth mm -hmm. and different systems. And I was really interested in why some countries were wealthier than others. And I think I, in, it just sort of influenced, firstly through politics, I think was the first obvious answer that came to mind. But I think the, the more I understood and, and the more I went through school, I started to think maybe economics was the real reason. And, uh, and then I studied it in year 11 and 12 and it was like, stuff clicking into place and it was like, oh, that's that's the difference, okay. And I found it a very uh, persuasive explanation for a lot of the, the things I saw in the world. And uh, I don't think that's ever really changed. Mm. That's how I got into economics. All right, thanks, thanks for starting uh, our discussion today. I'm gonna go to you next, Rowan. Was there, was there a key experience uh, that shaped your interest? How did, how did you become involved in studying economics at school or university? Yeah, that's a really good question because unlike Miriam, I didn't study it at school and I was um, somewhat of an accidental economist, I think it's fair to say. I started at university in politics, um, so some consistency there and doing a law degree as well. And when I worked out that the law degree wasn't for me, I looked for something else to supplement my arts degree um, and economics made a lot of sense. And some parallels actually with Miriam's answer in the sense that um, it was actually studying um, economic history, international economic history, and that framing of institutional responses to economic growth that I learned in that, that really made me think, oh, this is actually 
for me, sorry, I'm being interrupted by my children, don't mind me, um, that this was something that I was really passionate about that made a lot of sense to me and I had exactly that kind of aha moment that Miriam described of, oh, this helps me frame my understanding of the world and why the world is the way it is and why our history in Australia is the way it is compared to perhaps other countries overseas. Um, so that for me was the light bulb moment that made me think, yeah, this is something I'm going to stick with because it's a framework that helps me make sense of the world. Okay, thank you, Ron. Now, now Zara, what about for you? I, I just want to note you're, you're, you're muted there. Thank you. Just some of this sound familiar to you, or was was your was your interest interest cultivated in a in a quite a different way? Yeah, no, it's very similar to Miriam and Rowan's experiences. Um, I was interested in, in economics, even though I didn't know what economics was from a very young age. I think. Um, I was born and raised in Bombay in India, where you have people that live in multi-million dollar apartments that are two doors down from people living in huts and mm -hmm. Islam. And um, I really wanted to understand why those uh, large social and economic inequalities existed and what could potentially be done to help solve some of those big problems. Um, and the first time I tried economics at school, I didn't like it very much. Um, it didn't make sense to me and um, yeah, it just wasn't for me at the time. But then a year later when I moved to Australia, I tried it again and I fell in love with it because I had a teacher that was extremely passionate about the subject and she was really able to articulate, effectively articulate the value that we would get from studying economics um, and what it could do for our careers and also our daily lives. And that was a defining factor for me. Okay, thank you. Now, Rowan, I'm going to go to you next. Rowan, you've, you've had a number of different roles over your careers so far. Can, can you take us uh, along that, that pathway, that pathway? Uh, of your career journey briefly? And, and, and how has studying economics uh, helped you with different roles in your career? Yeah. No, I can do that. And I love that this is called kind of alternative careers in economics because it feels like my career was not necessarily a planned path. It was a series of, um, yeah, jumps from various things that only when you look back actually make sense. And when you look back, they all fundamentally track back to the fact that I studied um, economics, did my honours in economics, um, and from the honours program in Adelaide, there are um, kind of a couple of obvious places that most graduates end up, either at the Reserve Bank or at Treasury in Canberra or in sort of somewhere in state government. So I did start at Treasury as an economist in the macroeconomics group, um, which I enjoyed to a degree, but it wasn't my passion. Um, moved the, from there into the fiscal policy group, which was much more my strength, um, working on environmental policy, um, but from a treasury perspective, so still obviously always with the, the fiscal view in mind. Um, but that was the early days of emissions trading scheme design. This is a long time ago. Um, and that, um, yeah, that really got me off to a good start. And that was, you know, that was a, a building full of other economists. So you do learn a certain style when your first role is at the Commonwealth Treasury. Um, but they also gave an outstanding amount of professional development. So I completed my master's in economics while I was there um, and they're a very supportive employer. Um, and from there in, the, in an almost random series of, of um, changes, I ended up working um, overseas in a, a labour economics policy institute for a period. I came back to Australia, then I worked on welfare reform at the Cape York Institute for Noel Pearson. Um, that was again a treasury role, but I was outposted there. Um, and from there I moved to state government to again work in um, emissions policy. Um, and from there ended up working as the economic advisor to the Premier, which was sort of not an intended step into politics, but um, something that you would never say no to really when offered. Um, and a really fascinating role that put me much closer to the politics of policy, um, but gave me great um, exposure and understanding into how these decisions are made. Um, and from that economic advisor role to the Premier, I went subsequently to work for the Prime Minister as her economic advisor. Um, this was Julia Gillard. Um, and again, that all came back to the Treasury role. So my former Treasury colleagues were all over Parliament House at that point. Um, so it was that, that Treasury network um, that really sort of set me up for those roles. And that Treasury network was only possible because I'd studied economics and had that honours degree that had sent me to Treasury. So yeah, all roads do really point back to that. 
And then from that role in Canberra, which again, I loved in terms of just how interesting it was to be close to the centre of decision making, but it wasn't in Adelaide and I wanted to get back to where my husband was. Um, the role at KPMG opened up and it was a role um, looking after the South Australian government account. And obviously I'd worked in South Australian government for a long time. I knew it really well and was able to make that transition then into consulting. Um, but yeah, it only really makes sense in hindsight. <laughs> it certainly didn't feel like a career plan at the time. Thank you very much. Zara, you've recently started a new role with the Australian Space Agency. Can, can you give us a, a snapshot of what your day-to-day -day work life looks like? Um, and how, did, how does it compare to what you imagined when you were studying economics at uni? So um, the agency is made up of five teams and I work in the strategy and policy team and our primary responsibility is the development and implementation of the Australian Civil Space Strategy. And we also provide policy advice on civil space matters to our executives and the Australian government. Um, some of the things that we do on a daily basis is provide briefings to executives or ministers. So for example, if um, um, our minister is meeting with a chief executive from the industry, we would advise her on what are the sorts of things that they're doing, what are the sorts of things that the agency's doing, how we could potentially align what we're doing to achieve uh, common goals, things like that. Um, another big project that I'm working on at the moment is we're trying to develop an economic baseline of the sector, which essentially means that we're trying to estimate the value of the Australian space sector and its um, contribution to the overall economy. Um, this work's going to be really important in setting our future strategic direction as well mm -hmm. as policy development. Um, I always knew that I wanted to work in government. I did not imagine working for the Australian Space Agency. That came out of left field a bit. Um, yeah, so the first reason is because when I was at university, the agency didn't exist. But the second more important one is most people associate national space agencies with NASA. Um, NASA do things, does things like make rockets. We don't do that. Um, our focus is very different. Um, we're here to set the conditions that will enable industry led growth in the sector. Um, so it's a very different remit. Um, and there are departments all over Australia, different government levels um, that are looking for people that can support evidence-based policy development. And economics is one of those degrees that can help provide the necessary foundational skills um, to do that sort of work. Okay, thank you. Now, now Mary, am I curious about, about your career pathway? So you you also uh, studied economics, but now you now you work as a journalist. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think probably day by day, my job has the least to do with economics. I you know right. never never really. I mean, I do sometimes look at spreadsheets, but I don't do anything economical with them. Um, how do you use your economic yeah. knowledge in your role? How does that? Help yeah. Um, well, I guess um, I guess where the economic knowledge comes in is uh, is I guess in a sort of shared understanding. So I, I spend a lot of my role talking to people who are professionals in business and economic decision making, um, sometimes about economics, sometimes things about things that are tangentially related. But speaking the same language is, is really helpful. And I mean, I think the, um, the, the thing that I, I most got out of my economics degree is just, uh, I'm not scared by money or by talk of, uh, you know, spreadsheets or budgets or anything like that. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I, I don't really view it as something that's, you know, entirely beyond me. And I think a lot of journalists do view it as, you know, they tend to be a lot of, uh, a lot of humanities graduates. Um, and, and so they, they do recoil a little bit. And if you're willing to jump in, there's actually a whole lot of opportunities in journalism for people who are uh, not scared off by, by money and by business. Um, I think obviously it also does use a lot of other skills, uh, but uh, having having both the, the writing and the economics basis, um, I found it works really well for me. So, yeah. Thank you. Now we've been talking about economics and, and economics uh, uh, careers. 
as if people have a common understanding of the term terminology. Yet many of you said you'd sort of discovered economics, and I suspect that many other people in our lives uh, may not have uh, uh, a standing of economics unless they're directly working in the field. So, so how would you explain economics to someone not familiar with the topic? Okay, and what, what's something that might surprise other people about economics? If I can ask those together. Zara, do you want to kick off the discussion of those two questions? Yes, so economics to me um, at its core helps you understand the world and how it works. Um, and that can be at different levels, whether it's global, country, regional, or local. Um, but I think the most important thing that you pick up is being able to think critically about things and solve problems. Um, and those are two very highly desirable skills in the workforce today. Um, so economists to me are problem solvers. They identify an issue. They um, collect all the information related to that issue they then critically assess that information to form predictions and or solutions um, to achieve desired outcomes. Um, God, I feel like I've been in government way too long. Um, <laughs> and um, something that might surprise people about e economics is that it's largely subjective, at least in my opinion. Um, there are very different schools of thought out there. And if you're studying economics at university right now, you've probably been exposed to the neoclassical and or Keynesian ways of thinking, but there are a lot different ways of um, explaining the world. And I encourage you to research those um, because you'll be able to develop a more well-rounded view of the subject. Um, the other thing that might surprise you is you don't actually have to be great at math um, to be successful at it. Um, I think the most complicated course that I did was advanced economics in honors. And most of you would be pleased to know that I haven't actually used any of it um, since then. So um, there you go. Okay. All right. Rowan, when you're, when you're asked about what is economics, what, what, how do you explain what the topic is? And, and is there something that, that might surprise other people about, about the field? So for me, at its most fundamental level, it is about the system of incentives that exist around any particular problem. At a macro level, at a micro level, doesn't matter. Understanding the way that those incentives impact on behaviour and the human response to that. And to Zara's point, yes, that is much more sophisticated than just whatever your traditional neoclassical models would suggest. Um, but that if you can look at the world through that lens, that's kind of what makes you an economist. Because I kept having these conversations when I worked in a political office, I would say to um, my chief of staff at the time, you know, I'm just, I don't feel like I'm an economist anymore. I've been here too long. I feel like I've lost my technical expertise. He's like, no, no, you think like an economist and that's what matters. And for me, that thinking like an economist is, is always coming back to the system of incentives that are at play and how they impact on behaviour. Um, he was a lawyer, by the way, so he thought very, very differently to me. And for him, it was all about the exact precise meaning of words. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, it's more about the system and how the system influences behaviour and outcomes. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Mary, what about for you? What does economics mean, mean to you? How do you explain that to other people? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think Rowan's encapsulation is really good. Um, I mean, I, I, you could take it even simpler and just say it's a study of decision making. But yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of, it, it is about how, it's about reasoning in a sort of multi-step way about how the structure will lead to likely outcomes and uh, or, or affecting those outcomes if, if you're interested in it from a policy point of view, um, which which isn't what I do. I'm, I'm not a policy maker by any means. Um, so yeah, I, I think I just view it as a, a way of understanding things. Rowan, you mentioned now in your career, you're, you're um, working as a consultant, and uh, I'm sure you've worked with a wide range of, of, of clients on many different topics. Is there a, a particularly exciting or meaningful project you could, you could tell us a little bit about or highlight in your career generally? Um, that's 
it's a hard question to answer because there have been so many <laughs> projects. I've been at KBMG now for, um, gosh, eight years. Um, and over that time, I've done I've done a lot of really interesting pieces of work. Where I've gotten to um, is actually that, um, and it gets to the point about incentives and behaviour. I do a lot of strategy work in government with various different sort of senior leadership teams across state government um, and other organisations as well, but predominantly state government. And where I now come to is that um, leadership behaviour and culture are the things that eat strategy for breakfast. Now, none of that is actually economics, um, but in terms of understanding the environments in which people work, the incentives that face them in their workplace, the way in which collaboration can be increased or diminished through behaviour, um, that is actually, my husband would tell me, for my sins, I'm married to a professor of behavioural economics. So he would tell me that actually mechanisms that um, that support or um, or sort of leech away collaboration absolutely relate to economics and those questions of incentives and behaviour. So yes, on some level that is economics, but that's where I find the most interest in my work, to be honest, is that junction of leadership, culture, and the way that drives um, improvement or otherwise. Um, but I'd say that my most recent example of work that I found incredibly meaningful. So since I've left government, you always have that feeling of being somewhat of an outsider, a helpful outsider. You know, you bring in toolkits, you bring in teams of people with great skills who can do great things, but you are still an outsider. And when um, COVID-19 hit Adelaide in earnest, and we were all working sort of remotely and I was not able to engage in the same way with people face to face. I felt that acutely that I was really an outsider and not able to help. Um, and then when we were able to do some work with government that helped and I probably won't share the details of what those specific engagements were, but that gave me a great sense of meaning and purpose. And it actually helped me understand that as a consultant, that is my fundamental purpose. It's to be helping on the things that matter the most. Um, and so those COVID related pieces of work really had a great amount of meaning to me because it felt like you were making a difference to the biggest issue of the day and the moment and helping the people who needed the most help. Thanks so much for those examples. Now we hear a lot about the importance of transferable skills or professional skills. And, and I'm wondering about um, how helpful your background in economics has, 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 has been for, for, for learning transferable skills. So what skills did you learn in your degree that you've been able to take forward in your, in your career? Miriam, I might go to you on, um, on that question. So how helpful was, what, what are the kinds of transferable skills that you learned in your degree? Um, I think uh, uh, sequential reasoning, um, you know, one thing leads to one thing leads to another. Um, also just, uh, I guess, uh, uh, a comfort with complexity and with the idea that many things can be happening at the same time and some things will go in one direction and some things will go on the other and it's not really clear where you'll end up. Um, the sort of equilibrium idea um, I've, I've found very, very, pers very personally useful. Um, I think uh, generally, you know, I've, I've never studied anything I've found as broadly applicable as economics. I mean, it really does touch anything and economists do apply it to everything. And it's, um, it's, it's a foray in a way of understanding really, really complex and different fields, uh, you know, from, from sports to international development to how to make money the way businesses do and all of that um, to, yeah, nation states and why some are wealthier than others. And I think, uh, yeah, it's, I, I think it would be a bewildering world if I didn't have economics to guide me through it. So um, I'm, I'm a bit of an evangelist like that, but, uh, but I, I really think it's been immensely transferable, even if I'm not doing formal economics. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you. Sarah, what about for you? When you, when you think about the transferable skills that, that you've pulled out of your, your economics degree, which, which skills would you like to emphasize? Okay, just, just turn off your mute there, Zara, okay? There you go. Um, yeah, I think the critical thinking and problem solving skills come in handy on a daily basis, um, especially if you're gonna get into policy. Um, we are always trying to develop policy that is based on evidence. So research and data, data analytics um, are really important skills to have to econometrics and statistics um, 
but not the advanced math stuff. Um, that's way too much. Um, I'm just trying to think of other things. They're the main things, though. Okay. All right. Thanks for those examples. Rowan, do you, do you have any transferable skills that you would like to add to the conversation? I think just to reinforce what Miriam was saying, well, and what Zara was saying too, in terms of that point about data analytics, that is now, that is everything. Um, but it's only as good as your ability to take it and use it as evidence to mount an argument for something. Um, and that gets to that point about the transferable skills that Miriam was talking about in terms of, um, yeah, being able to put that evidence base together and make a compelling case for something. Mm -hmm. That's about as transferable as it gets. Um, and certainly that's something that I learned during my economics degree. Also during my arts degree, I'd have to be fair to my humanities teachers in that as well. Um, but yeah, I think that is one of the critical skills that you do learn in an economics degree that you definitely need at work in any role. Thank you. So I'm going to ask each of you a, a, a question, a, an individual question now. So, Sarah, going back to you now, what, what advice would you give to someone still studying at school? Um, so I think the most important piece of advice that I can give you is do something that interests you. Um, but apart from that, um, we have a STEM shortage in Australia and the demand for that, those skills are only going to increase. Um, so if you do a STEM subjects, you're um, going to be highly desirable in the workforce. Um, another thing that you could potentially co uh, consider is a space career. Um, it's a really exciting prospect for you to uh, think about because there's so many opportunities in space and um, Australia's role in space is only going to continue to increase. So there are going to be lots of opportunities. And I encourage you to visit the Australian Space Discovery Centre once it's set up in Adelaide next year, uh, because they're going to have a careers hub and they'll be able to explain the various opportunities available to you. Um, yeah, apart from that, I think think of doing something creative. Uh, that would be really good. Things that are not easily automatable um, are things that you could um, possibly consider too. All right, thanks for those. Thanks, thanks for those tips and advice. Now, Miriam, I'm going to go over to you and ask you to comment on an advice you would give to university economics students who mm -hmm. want to explore careers outside what might be a, a more traditional economic job or pathway. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess, you know, you teach what you know, and I was always, I went from one thing to the other largely based on what I was interested in. So I found media interesting. I was always a very big consumer of, of media. I volunteered for the university newspaper and then I ended up editing it and I ended up graduating from my economics degree with a tiny bit of media experience that I was able to relay into other media experiences until I ended up being a journalist. So you can go very far just being guided by what you're interested in and that'll probably be where you have a comparative advantage anyway. Um, the, the other thing I would say about university is um, I think when you're at university, there's, there's a natural flow towards doing more and more academic study. You think that if you, if you graduate with just the right degree or an honours or a master's uh, or, or, you know, even retrain a completely different degree, they'll teach you how to get a job in the private sector and, and you'll be able to continue in that way. Uh, I think that um, past a certain level, if you don't want to be a, a specialist academic economist uh, or, or someone who has a very, very definite interest in one field, you really shouldn't hesitate to just start. Just start in the workforce. It, it might not be the perfect job. It might not be a field that you know much about, but jobs really change so much. Uh, the, the job I started doing in journalism is nothing like the job I'm doing now. Uh, my day-to-day -day is completely different. And other people can, can achieve much, much greater shifts from where they start. So I think there's a lot to be said for earning money, getting stuff on your resume, leaving the little cocoon that is university, and uh, yeah, just, just starting. So. Thank you. Rowan, the question for you, we're going to, sh we're going to shift um, the focus from university to, to graduates. So what, what advice would you give to early career professionals? 
So I think it's pretty basic advice and it's basically to say yes to all the things that feel like they might be too hard or scary that you don't feel quite qualified for because you're as qualified as anybody else. Um, and that was the, the thing that made the difference to my career was that when the opportunities came, I said yes to them, not no to them. So even though I might have been inclined to go, oh, I just don't know if I'm quite ready for that or if that's something that I can really do, even with that level of nagging doubt, I kind of went, oh, yeah, let's give it a go and see what happens. And so that mindset of I'm not fully qualified but I'm capable and competent will get you a lot further than I'm not fully qualified because actually no one is ever fully qualified for every role that exists. So there is something about sort of taking opportunity when it knocks and not undermining and undervaluing the skills and capabilities that you've got. Thank you. Now, to summarise our discussion today, I'm going to ask each of you to finish uh, the sentence. So I'm going to give you the stem and I'm going to ask you to finish the sentence. So we'll go from, from Miriam to Zara to, to Rowan. All right, so here's the sentence stem. Economics is an important career for the future because... Okay, Miriam, just take off mute, please. Sorry. Okay. Um, just to to repeat myself, and I do keep harping on about this, but uh, but I think it's an important career for the future because without it, the world is much more bewildering. Uh, there's a lot of things you can study that don't have to do with human decision making, but human decision making is a pretty central one, and uh, economics will will help you get a handle on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Zara, do you want to take a, a, a crack at finishing that sentence? Economics is an important career future because? What Miriam said. <laughs> um, no, it's important because um, what would we do without economists? They're the ones that tell us where the world is going, where we're heading, what we need to do, what we need to think about, um, how we can be more conscious about um, things that are going on in the world. So. Yeah, I think their role is vital um, to, the, to us. All right, thank you. So Rowan, over to you for the wrap up sentence then. Uh, economics is an important career for the future because? Because it is still the dominant paradigm used to understand and communicate about how the world works. That might change, but it hasn't changed yet. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you so so much to to our our panelists for, for for providing such diverse perspectives about about a field and for sh for sharing some examples of your career pathways. Uh, just fantastic information for us to have today. Now I, I think we're going to turn to the the Q and A session now, and we wanted to leave quite a bit of, of time for for questions. So we'll work through. Uh, We'll work through um, as many as we can in our allocated time today. Okay, so let's. Um, what sort of? Here's one. What sorts of uh, of blogs, podcasts, or uh, uh, economists do you personally follow and recommend? I'll go first, just because my answer is so hopeless. I have two small children. I don't, and a very very busy job. I don't have time to follow anything or anyone. So honestly, my current um, up-to-date staying in touch with the field comes through conversations with my husband, which is a bit pathetic, but it is a fact. Um, so I'm sure Miriam's got a much better answer than that. Right. Given that she's a key resource for you. Yeah. All the media. Are, are there, Miriam or Zara, do you want to weigh in on this one? Yeah. Yep, I can go next. Um, I can recommend a couple of books for you um, by Mariana Mazzucato. Um, the Entrepreneurial State and the Value of Everything. They're great books to read, um, especially if you're still at university. Um, and another one that I'm reading at the moment is called Donut Economics uh, by um, Kate. Kate, I want to say Kate somebody. Um, I can't remember her last name, sorry. Um, but that's, um, that's a pretty good read too. Great, thanks for those tips. Mm. Um, yeah, I would, I, there's so much great writing and podcasts and things on economics, uh, in terms of just value for time to, to be across a lot of things. I think econ talk by Russ Roberts, which is the hour long podcast he does interviewing 
mostly people who have books out about economics um, can be a really time efficient way to, to keep on top of things. Um, an economist, probably my, my favourite economist at the moment is Emily Oster, um, who has done a whole bunch of work around uh, parenthood and uh, pregnancy and raising young children, sort of going back over the studies that, uh, I guess her central thesis is that a lot of things um, around healthcare are decided on by medical professionals, uh, which you would think would be appropriate. But uh, what, what happens if you actually look at them from someone who's got a very heavy sort of cost benefit risk sort of uh, matrix on it all? And what are reasonable risks and what are not reasonable risks? And if you look at a lot of stuff around medicine, you can actually get quite different answers uh, if you do that. So that was that's been really interesting and really useful in, in raising my baby. Um, so I've enjoyed that. Um, and it's also quite interesting in the age of coronavirus uh, to, to consider things in that same way. So I found it very topical. Thank you. Rowan, there's a question specifically for, for, for you. When, when did you decide that a certain field in economics maybe wasn't for you? Um, so so uh, and, and a follow up is any advice for future economic fresh grads who aren't sure where to go? Yeah, so maybe a backwards answer to that question is um, is actually don't give up too soon. So my example of that is around econometrics, which frankly I found horrifying for all of my undergraduate and into honours. Didn't understand a single word of what they were saying to me. Memorised everything, so passed everything, but fundamentally didn't understand what it was about until I got to my master's degree had a different teacher and it was like a kind of light bulb moment where everything suddenly fell into place and made sense. So there is something in there about persevering past the bits that are really difficult um, because at a point in time that might make sense for you and it all might roll from there. But there's also something in what Miriam said, which is, you, you know, find the bits of it that you're passionate about that make sense to you, that really speak to you and get to the point around your core purpose and what matters to you and put more energy into those than the others, because they're the things that are gonna make you wanna get out of bed every day and go to work um, and, and do the role that sort of aligns to those things. So there's definitely a piece in there around follow your passion, but also don't give up just because it's difficult because you might get that sudden light bulb moment where it all falls into place. Yeah, so that, that's a great uh, segue also from, from the previous uh, answers that the panel offered is just trying out things and and uh, seeing seeing where 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 your career pathway takes you, uh, so so that's an interesting one. I, I'm curious, um, you know, with a with with a bachelor degree in in economics, uh, what how do you how would you encourage people to represent their experience going out to the job market? So I have a bachelor's degree in economics. Um, I have never found anyone who, so people with economics degrees view bachelor degrees as like the first step. People without bachelor degrees don't view them that, without economics bachelors just think of you mm -hmm. as an economist, which I mean, I'm always like, oh, you know, I'm not an economist, I only have a bachelor, you know, an economist is someone who does economic study, which I don't do. But, uh, but colloquially, um, people will take it seriously, um, particularly if they know a little bit less about economics than perhaps people who do have an economics yeah. degree. Okay. I think that gets to that point of where you're applying to, because um, there's a question in the in the chat around for certain jobs like Treasury, do you need postgraduate study? There are certain employers that absolutely will only look at you if you've got an honours degree, but there's not very many of them. To Miriam's point, most of them actually are not in that category. It's Treasury and the RBA. It's kind of it. Um, and if you're applying anywhere else or you've got an interest anywhere else, then you can absolutely represent your bachelor's degree as what it is, which is giving you a really, really sound understanding of economics. Um, so I think it depends ultimately on where you want to start as a graduate or in your first role. Um, and then that kind of informs your choice about whether to go further with study before you apply for jobs or perhaps after or perhaps not at all. Yeah. So, uh, so from, from your work experience, what, what, do you, what do you think is the, maybe the biggest work life work uh, content distinction between you know, working uh, within private sector versus public sector in, in, in economics work? So um, Sarah, do you, do you want to take that up? Um, I haven't actually worked in the private sector before, so, uh, but 
I know that working in the public sector can be extremely rewarding because um, especially if you work in something like policy, um, you can see what the things you do and what are the things you do and how they impact um, on the general public, whether it be industry or societies or whatever. Um, and working in government is great because um, government's an advocate of flexible working. We have a lot of women working in the public sector because of that. Um, so I highly encourage you to consider um, at least starting your career in government because it's worked really well for me at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rowan, you've gone back in between public and private sector over your career pathway. Are there any distinctions you would highlight? Um, only to say that, yes, absolutely, Zara's right, the point about flexibility and women in the public service, they're absolutely spot on. But also some of the hardest working people I know are senior executives in the public service. So there is this bit of a myth, I think, that you know the public servant gets to knock off at 4.55. That may be true of some of them, but um, the people who've got the interesting roles and the roles that are influential and have that policy and strategy dimension and that get things done, they're not knocking off no. till much, much, much later than that. So there is this bit of a fallacy about the, um, you know, the lazy public servant. It's just not true. There's some of the hardest working people I've ever met are in the public sector. Um, so I didn't notice too much of a difference, to be honest, in terms of work-life balance. Um, but because I'm currently 0.8 because I've got sort of childcare responsibilities as well. The one thing I would say about work-life balance that matters regardless of whether you're in the public or private sector is you've got to set some boundaries around the time that is your non-working time and put some parameters in place around defending that and have some criteria for, okay, this is a meeting I will accept on my day off. This is a meeting that I, under no circumstances will I accept on my day off. And they're different for everybody. But um, if you don't have a kind of a clear framework about what is urgent and unavoidable, you'll just end up working full time, no matter what your actual working arrangements are. And I think that's true in either the public sector or the private sector. Right. There's a couple of questions that have international themes. In it. So uh, one is very specific to the field of international development. And so are there are there potential growth opportunities in for economists in in the um, international development field? Anyone want to take that question on? Not with a whole lot of knowledge, if anyone's sort of hesitating to jump in, um, because it's not really a career path that I pursued. But I mean, there are people that I know who I worked with in Treasury who are now outposted to all of the different development agencies internationally. Um, so yes, there's, there is definitely opportunity there. Whether it's to do the kind of hands-on grassroots work that you might want to do, as opposed to the policy work where you're actually in Washington, not in the country. I think that's a distinction that's worth making and thinking about is what kind of international development work you want to do. And again, that goes back to where your passion lies. If it's policy, there are absolutely policy jobs. Um, if it's if it's different and it's more about working in country, um, then I'm actually genuinely not sure what the pathways look like. I don't know if the other panelists have got better insight than me. I think the only thing that I can think about in terms of policy and international development is um, trying to find a role in a department with a trade and investment focus or, or trade or something like that. Um, that's all I can think of at the moment. Can we, can we open that, um, that discussion a little more broadly to international opportunities? So maybe you um, I, uh, have colleagues who work internationally in, in the area of economics? Any comments about potential opportunities for, for international work generally? Um, I think if you work in um, one of the big four consulting firms, there's probably plenty of opportunity to go overseas because they have bases pretty much everywhere. Rowan, you'd probably be more qualified to answer this question. Um, but yeah. Yeah, there certainly are opportunities for doing that. And um, in terms of the government agencies that you might end up working for as economists, they also have a lot of postings 
Um, not a lot and they're very competitive and hard to get, but they do have postings. Um, and obviously if you kind of go all the way um, in terms of your qualifications and you end up as an academic, that's absolutely a borderless, well, not at the moment because of COVID, but in normal times, that is a borderless career. So, um, you know, there are Australians all over the world with economics qualifications teaching at other universities. And likewise, we've got people from all over the world in Australia teaching economics. Um, so I think it is genuinely a global career platform. Okay, thank you. So so just go back to your own career pathway a, a little bit. Did, did you know what what specific area of economics you wanted to work in when, when you left university or or did you did you and did you, did you only apply to those areas or did you oh there was a job related to economics so I, I took that one and I and I've moved from that time what how, how did you manage your own choices when you graduated I just grabbed the first job that seemed reasonable um, I mean you know I journalism maybe you don't get to be too picky but uh I, I grabbed a, a job reporting on small business, um, which is sort of, you know, related to business and economics, you know, not particularly, but, uh, but yeah, I just ended up, I think, somewhere much more suited to my interests just over time, um, just by moving within organisations or making small steps, uh, which, which I think often works pretty well. Okay. Right. Okay. So how about you? When, when you? when you graduated, did you steer your job search in a particular way or was it an opportunity uh, a situation where an opportunity came along and you took it i applied for everything and i what i got um i re i was really hoping for something in government and i got a job at the department of state development South australian government so um that was very fortunate that i was able to get that role um, as a graduate mm. okay all right. Now, um, it's it seems that a lot of a lot of um, programs in economics are are um, imbalanced in terms of the number a uh, ratio of um, self identifying and self identifying males versus females. So, so um, how how do you manage the networking? As a, as, a, as a woman in the field in, in order to get established in your career, what, what, would you, what might you say about um, navigating the gender imbalance and, and also um, making sure that you're making the kinds of contacts that, that make a difference in, in, in career success? That's an hour in and of itself. Um, I'm yes. really interested to hear Miriam's answer to that in journalism, but if you want my quick answer, it's um, I've gone out of my way to actively cultivate networks of women. So we host forums that are specifically for women. Um, but I also, I mean, I spent the first 10 years of my working life as the only woman in just about every meeting I was ever in. Um, and when I worked for the Premier, well, that wasn't true in Treasury. There were lots of women in Treasury. Once I left Treasury, that's when that became true. Um, men who would assume that I was there to make the tea because I was the only woman and I was under 30. Um, so I must be the PA as opposed to the economic advisor. You just kind of got to, you've just, I don't know, this sounds like terrible advice because the world shouldn't be like that. But when it is like that, you've got to make it work for you and you've got to find your own voice in those rooms and not be intimidated by the fact that you're only the only woman in the room um, and not let that impact on the point of view that you've got and that you've got something of value to say and that's regardless of your gender um so there's a there's a skill set you need to develop which is that just eventually doesn't bother you anymore um but i think the world is changing too i think what it was like for me when i was um sort of starting out hopefully isn't what it's like anymore but um but mira i'm really keen to hear from you because i think journalism is a bit of a is a bit of a bloke's game isn't it yeah, um, and um, the senior levels of corporate Australia, so the, the type of people who talk to business journalists are very bulky as well. Um, I found that uh, things got a lot easier for me when I got it out of my mind that I was going to network in the way that I saw men network. You know, I, I just wasn't really going to be able to, to, you know, go for after work drinks or like do things in quite the same way. I mean, not that I don't have social relationships with uh with you know with 
people in the workplace and outside, but it was just different. And I just knew I wouldn't really be one of the boys. But I guess what I came to sort of find as effective is, you know, you might not be one of the boys, but that doesn't mean that uh, they, they won't respect you and they won't know that you're not someone who, you know, can do the job. And luckily enough, I've always worked in places that have been competitive enough that being able to do the job well hasn't really stopped me uh, advancing. I don't know if that will work forever. Um, I don't know if that would work in all, all places. Um, working in nice workplaces that aren't really terrible is probably a bit of good advice. Um, and, and I know some workplaces, there's very little that women can do to make things easier for themselves. But um, I think I've just uh, learned to accept some limits, but, uh, but work with what I've got, I guess. All right. you're, you're so right about finding the right workplace though because mm -hmm. the, and the tipping point that is created when there are enough women in senior roles that helps create that culture where all women can flourish. I feel like KPMG reached that tipping point maybe five years ago and that it was noticeably different before then and after then. Um, and now there are, I think I should know the number, um, it's somewhere I think around 35% of female partners um, and it is a noticeably different environment and you can see that the junior women, I don't think any of the women who are sort of 24 and starting out their careers are having the same experience that I had at that age starting out my career, which is a nice thing to be able to see. Yeah. Zara, would you like to comment on that topic? Oh, you're right, just change your mute. Yeah. I think by the time um, I entered the workforce, um, these issues weren't as prominent and um, I have been extremely lucky to have very supportive um, women and men in senior roles support my career development mm -hmm. and as an introvert I've always found it really awkward trying to network and um, I used to have mentors that would actually make me practice speaking to new people which was incredible so um, yes uh, my experience has been great so far. So, so what helped you to get started? I, let's go back to that time, just getting, you know, getting started in your field. Was there, you, we talked about the content within economics programs at universities, but you, some of you mentioned some extracurricular activities or ways that you made connections. So, so thinking about um, your experience, what's, what's helped you to get a foot in the door and are there some, some key activities that you might recommend to people who are who are really starting out in the field. I mean, I, I can just say in, you know, and I know I'm sure it's a very small number who are interested in journalism, but uh, but it is um, the case in many other fields, I think, as well, which is just if you can sort of work for free, which I know is terrible and it means that only people who are wealthy can actually get into these roles. But, uh, but that is unfortunately the way a lot of things work in Australia. If you go in as a work experience kid, being able to do the job, they think, oh, maybe we should get you to do the job. And uh, maybe this is one of the wonderful things about government work in that they don't expect you to train on your own time. But uh, that's unfortunately the, the way I've found it works in the private sector. So just getting related work experience. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, Zara, was there something that was pivotal for you to to just get started or something you would recommend to our audience? Look, I think if you just work hard and if you're passionate about what you do, you're going to be fine. Um, there were times where I thought, oh, my contract's not going to get renewed or mm -hmm. uh, whatever. And it always managed to work out because people understood the value that I brought to the job. And if you're able to demonstrate that and realize what your value is, you can sell it anywhere. Okay. So now I'm gonna ask you to put your crystal ball on. <laughs> you look into your crystal, crystal ball for the future. So what, what do you see happening um, in terms of trends in the field of economics? We're, if, we, if we were, we're um, having this panel Posting this panel interview five years from now, uh, what do you think we'd see? We have a current context, economic context within Australia and the world. Um, where do you see the, the the trends for for careers in economics going? 
Can I go back to something that Zara said in one of her sure. comments earlier, which is either be the creative that can't be replaced by a machine or be enough of a data and STEM person that you're controlling the machine. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of the two divergent future paths that we have in front of us. Like you're either the human who is so irreplaceably human um, that you will always be needed or you are sufficiently STEM literate. And for me, it just keeps going back to data, data, data at the moment. Um, that you will flourish in that world. And I am not that person. So I'm going to have to be irreplaceably human because I've got no other options. I think personal skills are also really important. Um, what was that, Zara? I just couldn't hear you. What was that? Called? Personal skills are oh, okay. um, being able to develop relationships and using them to um, achieve things is really important. Um, if I were to take a really sort of macro view on that question, I think uh, one of the real trends in economics and economic journalism and economics discussion has just been monetary policy, um, cheap money, easy money, assets inflating, uh, you know, on the sort of um, fringe end, you've got people talking about modern monetary theory. Um, and, you know, and then even the RBA will, will do is doing all sorts of interesting things. And I think, uh, Seeing, I mean, I don't know how that will play out. I'm, I'm not enough of a crystal ball gazer to give any predictions, but I think what is happening right now is, is really unprecedented and really interesting. And I think it's going to be very interesting from a straight economics point of view, but it's going to affect all of us. Um, and it'll be, you know, having people who can understand it and follow it and perhaps influence this uh, new way of managing economies we've got, which is just the, the world of cheap money. Um, is is going to be really interesting to watch in the next five to ten years. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, we have we have um, a number of other questions. I wish I wish we had a longer time to to uh, reflect on all of the the questions. But I, I'm mindful that our, our time for the for our, our presentation is coming to to an end. So thanks so so much to each of the panelists for for your insights and sharing your your experiences related to the field of economics. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Welcome, thank you. It's me going on mute. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights this afternoon. Um, look, I, I have an economics background um, and a degree and I've learned a lot about the different career opportunities. I'm sure many of the people on the line, whether they're um, you know, a school student, university student, or already working um, in an economics economics field have also learned a lot about the different pathways so thank you um, we would really appreciate it if those listening could fill out a quick poll um, to let us know where you're at in your career and where you're from um, you know we know that um, you know it's, it's really helpful for us to understand um, those things so we can help better tailor our events and on that note um, I think we had over well over 50 questions come through. Um, so unfortunately, we couldn't um, answer all of them, but we'll definitely, um, you know, the Women in Economics Network is very keen to make sure that we do, um, you know, we'll, we'll think about a way to answer some of those questions in a, in a different forum. Um, one thing I would note is that if your questions are around things like career pathways, degree combinations, that sort of thing, um, there are lots of options probably near you in the form of career counsellors or even calling a university. There are a lot of people who are very keen to help, um, help, uh, help you with those decisions. Um, as well, if you're interested in economics, um, the WEN and Economic Society, we both have a very full calendar of online events, all of which are free for our members and many of them, including this one, are free or low cost for the general public as well. So if you hop onto our website, you can see the list of upcoming events um, and register. And if you're interested in economics, even if you don't know much about the topic, um, please join us um, and hopefully you'll, you'll learn something new. Um, we also have a, a Facebook group and a Twitter and a LinkedIn where you can learn more about um, job opportunities, news articles, the latest research and our events. Um, and that's also a really good way if you're looking to get into the field, just being exposed to the different things um, and those kinds of opportunities um, would hopefully go some of the way towards answering those questions. Um, so thank you uh, again to everyone who joined us. Uh, 
hope you're able to continue supporting us in the future. Um, your membership does help us bring these kinds of activities to you um, and advocating for a greater representation of women in economics in Australia. Um, of course, um, you know, we're also really passionate about making sure more people study economics in general too. So I really hope this webinar has been very helpful. Um, this has also been recorded. So for people who perhaps couldn't um, stay for the whole time or couldn't make it, we will post this online at a later date. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, stay healthy and stay safe wherever you are. Thank you. Mm -hmm.